Good afternoon and welcome back. I hope everyone's had a, a fantastic day. I know I have. I thoroughly enjoyed the time with our uh, students, uh, their sessions. I hope many of you all had a chance to attend some of those. They were wonderful. Um, my name is Brett Wilmot. I'm the Associate Director of the Ethics Program here at Villanova University. And, and just in case some of you are joining us for the first time this afternoon, I wanted to extend a warm welcome to all of you, and especially to our guests from the United States Military Academy at West Point. Um, we've really had a wonderful day. Our, our first two plenary sessions were, were well attended and, and excellent discussions and questions from the audience, and I'm sure this afternoon's will we'll repeat that. Um, before I introduce our, our guests and, and get us rolling, I do have a, just a few quick announcements to make regarding events this evening and then tomorrow. Um, for, for those of you who are pre-registered um, and are joining us for dinner this evening, there's a 5.30 cocktail hour at the conference center, and so we'd ask that you try to join us for that if you can. Dinner will follow at 6.30. <laughs> and then tomorrow morning, we will reconvene for breakfast just as we did this morning. So over in the Bartley, the, in the business school where, where we folks came in this morning, there will be coffee and, and bagels and muffins and these kinds of things starting at 9.15, and we will reconvene back in this room for our final plenary session at 10 a.m. All right, so we'll look forward to seeing hopefully um, everyone again tomorrow morning. All right, anything else? No, we're good? Excellent. All right. <laughs> Um, well, our final uh, the topic this, this afternoon is, is one that I'm particularly fascinated with and I'm very much looking forward to the conversation. Our main speaker is, let me get my notes out really quick, is going to be Nancy Sherman speaking on the topic of moral injury and moral repair. Um, Dr. Sherman is university professor and professor of philosophy at Georgetown University. Between 1997 and 1999, she served as the inaugural holder of the Distinguished Chair of Ethics at the United States Naval Academy. She's the author of The Untold War, Inside the Hearts, Minds, and Souls of Our Soldiers, Stoic Warriors, The Ancient Philosophy Behind the Military Mind, Making a Necessity of Virtue, Aristotle and Kant on Virtue, the Fabric of Character, Aristotle's Theory of Virtue, and she has been the recipient of fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, National Endowment for the Humanities, and the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. So I'd like to just extend a warm welcome to Nancy. And really quickly, I'm going to introduce our respondents. And, um, and what will happen is, is Nancy will give her talk, and then we'll have our respondents follow and for about 10 minutes each. And at that point, we'll open up for questions from the audience. Our, our first respondent is, is Major Kevin Sheeman. He's an instructor of philosophy in the Department of English and Philosophy at the United States Military Academy at West Point. Major Sheeman has served as an aviation officer since receiving his commission from the United States Military Academy in 2003. His operational assignments include two combat rotations in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom and humanitarian relief operations in support of Joint Task Force Katrina. Before being assigned as an instructor, he completed his master's degree in philosophy at Georgetown University. And his most recent projects include an attempt to reconcile political realism with conceptions of the nobility of military service and an attempt to revise a popular conceptual analysis of sport. From Villanova, our second respondent is Dr. Helene Moriarty. She is professor in the College of Nursing and the Diane and Robert Moritz Jr. Endowed Chair in Nursing Research. Her publications have addressed key conceptual, methodological, and ethical issues in research with vulnerable families. She serves on the editorial board of the Journal of Family Nursing and as chair of the research committee of the International Family Nursing Association. Dr. Moriarty served as nurse researcher at the Philadelphia Veterans Affairs Medical Center for 20 years. In this role, she gained extensive experience in conducting research with military veterans and their families using quantitative, qualitative, and mixed methods. So let's just give a quick welcome to our two respondents. And with that, I'd like to turn over the, the, the podium to Nancy, please. Appreciate it. Oops. 
going to leave this here so I don't need it. Well, thank you. Uh, how am I doing on audibility? Okay. Uh, thank you so much. I'm sorry I wasn't here in the morning. I kind of got felled by some awful bug. Um, and I just think it's amazing to bring together my West Point friends and new friends um, here, um, as well as uh, us um, folks that haven't been in the line of service, except for undergraduates and graduate students. So thank you. I hope sequestration and the like does not stand in the way of future um, such events. And certainly happy to open Georgetown's um, coffers to the degree I control them, which I don't, <laughs> um, to uh, bring us together again. Um, so I'm going to talk primarily about hope. This is part of a larger project soon nearing, we may just go dancing here for a little bit, <laughs> soon nearing completion, um, tentatively titled uh, Making Peace with War, about um, homecoming and the moral, and the moral struggles. Returning service members often carry the weight of their war and messy moral emotions that are hard to process and sometimes hard to feel. Some of these emotions get sidelined in clinical discussions of post-traumatic stress, when the stressor is narrowed to exposure to life threat in the face of unpredictable danger, and symptoms are streamlined to three categories of hypervigilance, numbing, and intrusive thoughts or flashbacks as an example. And as one senior military psychiatrist well known in the field and just retired uh, Army Colonel uh, uh, Dr. Charles Hogue, uh, Chuck Hogue puts it, under prolonged stress, the stress thermostat is reset. But the idea of resetting thermostats is limiting. And in recent years, a number of military psychological researchers and DOD, VA uh, folks have pushed for the idea of moral injury in order, and in fact, the new DSM, Diagnostic and Statistic Manual, which is the um, classic uh, Bible for uh, getting your health care benefit, be benefits paid um, and attaching some kind of condition to you. Um, it, it has moved to include a category that, that has shame and fear and falling short of expectations, which I think is really important. But the stressor still seems to be a sense of helplessness, which is too restrictive. I don't really want to talk about the clinical side because I am not a clinician, but my work does interlace with colleagues that are working in the area. But one thing to note is that those that are working in the area have argued that, that is a clinical area, that some exposure techniques, prolonged exposure techniques, standardly used to desensitize a fear condition and extinguish that fear response just don't have much Okay, just don't have much effect in addressing crippling moral doubt and survivor guilt, some, some of the moral emotions. So what goes unremarked in that research is the ubiquity of emotions such as guilt, I write about this a lot in Untold War, shame, resentment, disappointment, empathy, trust, and hope. Not in a clinical setting, but just as healthy aspects of processing difficult situations, including exposure to war. And a critical part, they become a critical part of emotions of holding persons to account. Now, this is not a traditional subject for philosophers of war, whose primary focus uh, is on justifications of norms of war. But it is a standard part of moral psychology, philosophical moral psychology, and particularly notably begun by Peter Strawson in 1962 in his classic study of reactive attitudes uh, and on literature that is expanding leaps and bounds. With 2.6 million soldiers coming home from a centuries long wars, I think it's, it's time to bring philosophy to bear and philosophical moral psychology on the issues that soldiers face, in particular, a discussion of reactive attitudes. And this is a way also of, of bringing the philosophy, the philosophical ethics of war into mainline, into discussion with mainstream philosophical thought. <coughs> so I want to begin this particular chapter of the book um, 
uh, uh, sort of modified for today, is about hope. And I want to begin with a, a section I call Defiant Hope. And my starting point is a, a, a movie I saw, a documentary called Defiant Requiem. Um, and it essentially tracks the recreation of Verdi's Requiem and the extant walls of Tereczen, uh, which was a transit camp um, uh, in Theresienstadt, Czechoslovakia, used by the Nazis to process 30, to process many, many Jews to death camps and beyond. <coughs> so, as, as many know, Tereczen or Tereczen, um, included was it was a place to hold many accomplished artists, pianists. Musicians, performers, conductors, composers, and one such person was Raphael Schechter, a talented pianist and opera choral conductor captured by the Nazis in 41 from Prague. And he brought with him just one piece of music, and it was Giuseppe Verdi's 1874 Requiem. And during the internment, and with complicity of the guards, if you remember, Theresien Ter Schott was a propaganda piece for the Nazis, he would he was given a piano and he gathered people in the basement, dark, dank basement, to rehearse over and over and over again the Requiem. There's only one copy of the score and a rickety piano. These individuals, the inmates, sang with hope against hope to change minds, to have the Nazi leadership hear the humanity of their voices and rescind their death sentence. That hope became increasingly futile as one death train after another <clears throat> rounded up Jews and took them on death marches and beyond. And when that happened, the winnowing population got replenished with more coming to the piano and singing. And now, for the inmates, it was survival, but for um, and, and Sidlin says in remarks at a showing I saw in Washington that the refrain in the Requiem, now the conductor was Murray Sidlin, uh, who did this documentary and recreation, the, the, the refrain, Dies Irae, that the day of wrath would come, was ironically for these Jews unpracticed in the rituals of Latin masses, a moral protest that they could deliver face to face to their torturers concealed through art. It was their retribution. But singing the Requiem also expressed their hope, and hope with two interrelated faces. The prisoners sang to express hope for a future outcome or eventuality, to be saved, to be rescued, redeemed, whether by God's hand or by human intervention. And that hope for outcome nourished some, despite desperate hunger. And as one survivor recalled, singing was her food that brought her near near death corpse to life again. She just died at 110 in London. <coughs> but another aspect of their hope, far more galvanizing, I suspect, was the hope that they had in each other, not for an outcome, but in each other, and the aspirations they placed in their humanity by singing together. After backbreaking days of labor and beaten servitude, they raised their voices and followed an extremely complex musical score. They worked on their parts, put them to memory, and saw them mirrored in each other, saw mirrored in each other high humanity. They kindled hope in each other and in themselves, in their potential to rise above subjugating circumstances. And they were essentially engaged in what becomes important in, um, in this chapter and in the book, moral address. They reciprocally addressed and recognized each other, and in this context, acknowledged each other's hope in humanity. Perhaps, too, they had hope in the Nazi leadership that their art would awaken their own humanity. But I can't imagine that that energized as much as the reciprocal hope they placed in each other, a calling out through music of the potential of others' humanity and an echoing back in acknowledgment that one's been recognized. Singing night after night was an act of defiance. <laughs> And in fact, they did sing before the Nazi brass, who viewed it as candy, in a way. And um, uh, um, it was clear during the performance that there wasn't going to be salvation as hoped for. Now, this is a powerful example of interpersonal hope, even in feudal conditions. 
hope can be about eventualities, non-normative hope, as uh, a colleague I just saw at Penn, Adrian Martin, has written in a fine new book with Princeton. Um, but it also can be about aspirations we hold on behalf of persons, normative hope, she says. And in some cases, though not all, part of the point of addressing others with hope is that the recipients might take up the values or principles deemed worthwhile and aspired for on their behalf. Hope can scaffold normative change. It's a point that readers of Aristotle will remember from Nick McKeon 110. Aristotle says, uh, I hear you use a word that my colleagues um, use. Um, Aristotle kind of misattributes uh, happiness to a child, for a child doesn't yet have the virtue and wisdom of happiness. But <coughs> that's Mark Lanson, Rebecca Cooper's term. But rather gives it, attributes it to the misattributes to the child on the hope. Aristotle says that the child will be deemed uh, and esteemed happy. So it's a kind of scaffolding to pull someone up, uh, as Jerome Bruner would put in the psychological literature. And Aristotle makes clear that he's thinking about normative hope because he says it would be ridiculous to think of happiness as something you just come by as a matter of luck and, and, and trust to the gods. It has to be a matter of study and care, he says in the Nicobachean. So I think he's got that kind of hope in mind, and Stoics give a whole story about how he doesn't go far enough, but that's for another day. Um, and I should just mention, in case I don't get to it later on, because I think it's important, we're talking about high art here, um, Verdi's Requiem, but the idea of call and response that I see mirrored in this, audio, in this group of near corpses is really, I was sort of thinking about this by watching a wonderful movie I recommend to you, another movie, um, called um, 20 Feet from Stardom, um, about the backup singers um, in uh, the typically black backup singers um, to um, uh, folks like Stevie Wonder, Mick Jaggers, um, and, um, and the like. And they are trained in gospel, they answer a call, and sometimes they're much better than the lead singer, uh, a Mick Jagger sometime, and watch the movie, it's amazing. But they are essentially in a call and address, back and forth response, um, um, call response mode that I think has important moral dimensions. So with that as background, I want to continue with the following topics that take us to the subject of war and uh, as in much of my recent work based on a lot of interviews with folks coming home from the centuries long wars. Um, I want to make some just very brief general remarks about reactive attitudes. Um, uh, and then I want to consider non-normative hope in a soldier's story, um, someone I know and uh, keep up with. And then I want to consider normative hope, um, uh, hope in persons. Uh, both intra-psychically and inter-psychically, within and between persons. So, um, as I say, one way of thinking about expressed reactive attitudes, and, and by them I mean things like, sorry, uh, resentment, shame, resentment, indignation, second personal, uh, self-reactive, shame and guilt, um, and Resentment is the one that Bishop, Bar uh, um, Bishop Butler always talks about, Stephen Darwell talks a lot about stepping on someone's toe and the resentment you would feel in response. But Strawson had a wider spectrum that include positive emotions as well, and there's work now being done on positive reactive attitudes, and that's partly what I want to say. And these are not just grief and sorrow, but they're ways by which we hold persons to account. We participate in a moral commonwealth and ask them to take responsibility for the way they've treated us or the way we've treated others um, in, our, in our actions or expressions. Um, and so one way, just very briefly, again, going through this section, and I, I think I need a, um, a time that I'm supposed to stop, because I don't remember when I began. <laughs> um, I'd say 
Five four, 540? Oh, yeah. Okay, 544. Um, and I'm standing between, we're standing between people and, and dinners. 440. Okay, I'm not going until 540. Don't, don't you worry. I could stand up here for that long today. <laughs> So one way of thinking about reactive attitudes are as demands or expectations. That has come up with um, um, Jay Wallace's uh, writing, um, Gary Watson, uh, amongst others. But it's a narrow way of thinking about uh, reactive attitudes, even in the case of resentment. Because if, if you step on someone's, someone steps on your toe, and they and you're angry and they promise not to do it again it doesn't really help you with the hurt that you feel right now um, and if they just behave contritely as opposed to feel contrite then that doesn't really get to the core either Adrian that's Colleen McNamara speaking there and then Adrian Martin has said well there's a lot of positive reactive attitudes like hope that are more about aspirations and demands. You aspire on behalf of someone, like your kids, but you know their internal external struggles and, and that there may be hurdles along the way and you give slack. Um, I was um, teaching at Penn yesterday, there was an army captain in the class and he said, yeah, like I tell my uh, unit members, I don't know if he's here right now, Charles, he said, I'm disappointed in you. Parents say this all the time: the, the failure of hope. You didn't leave, you, you didn't live up to the aspirations I invested in you. It's certainly a moral um, reaction to some sort of failure. Um, so, I just want to suggest throughout that I am thinking. I don't have a clear notion if a call and address model works for all reactive attitudes, but it might if we loosen the rubric a bit and not just have demand and expectation, but also include aspiration. But before I move to normative hope, I want to talk about a kind of hope that we all know a little better, and that's hope for outcomes. Now, even raising the issue of hope for some can be kind of uh, distasteful, supine and spiritual, and someone, some very distinguished philosopher whose name will remain unspoken said to me, oh, that's very nice, Nancy, very la di da uh, <laughs> Meaning, it's a soft emotion, it's, uh, in this environment it wouldn't bother you if it's Christian, but some, you know, think too connected with theological matters, etc. Um, I'm thinking of hope for outcomes, roughly the way um, Pettit um, has thought about them, um, Philip Pettit at Princeton, as a kind of cognitive resolve, a form of planning uh, that, 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 that can anchor you. And he has wonderful phrases that can lift you from the hurly-burly of conflicting evidence when you would otherwise just sink to despair. And it, um, he says, I have to, in, uh, to have to form the hope that something is the case, or that I can, or that I or someone else will manage to make it the case. I have to invest that scenario with a level of confidence. It may exceed the confidence of my actual belief in the prospect, and with a degree of stability that will certainly exceed the stability of my actual belief. Um, and he says it's an alternative pragmatic posture to um, fact processing, probability assessing, ledger keeping, evidence seeking mentality uh, that would save us sometime when we're beaten down, his language, by inimical fact. And many have talked about agential investment as carrying that weight. Um, and I, I think that's useful. We can quibble, as Adrian Martin does, a little bit about whether it's a, a, a special kind of desire or it's just you can map hope as re a regular belief on a, on a more vanilla belief desire model. Um, but one thing it isn't is it's not, I'm not thinking of it as idle wish. I'm not, wish for immortality, says, um, says Aristotle. That's not what I'm thinking about. Nor necessarily Freud, when he says, you know, you have um, wishful thinking. You 
armor yourself against reality constantly in order to um, think of yourself as omniscient or, 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 or be fanciful. But I am thinking about it as involving imagination often, very constructive imagination. Here I think the work of Jonathan Lear is very useful, although he talks about radical hope involving imagination. He, and he has an example of Plenty Coup, and I said Sue Leader, the Crow Leader, um, in the paper. Um, who dreamt a, dreamt, dreamt a dream that helped his people figure out how to go on when the culture was radically different from what it would be, for the, the future culture was radically different from what it had ever been like in the past, namely life without the buffalo, the death of the buffalo due to American um, manifest destiny and the like. Um, so, um, um, what, what brought home or made me really curious about thinking about hope was uh, an acquaintance of mine, Dan Brzezinski, a West Point graduate, 25 year at the time a 25 year old first lieutenant um, in command of an infantry platoon in Kandahar, stepped on a bomb while trying to retrieve the remains of his unit observer. A botched up medevac left Dan bleeding profusely and his family pretty sure he wasn't going to make it alive out of Afghanistan. In the end, he was stabilized enough to be put on a, on a plane to launch to a regional medical center, though too fragile to even get out of the plane. And within a week, he was in Waller Reed in a, in a um, induced comatose coma. And his parents awaited, amazing people, Bob and Susan Bruschinski I've spoken to, um, awaited to see if he was going to pull through. Um, people really didn't think. But as Susan said to me, once they brought him out of the coma, it was rapidly apparent that he was still there. But his body wasn't there, or wasn't all there. And he essentially lost everything torso down, including, critically, his hip. And you can't sit in a chair without a hip. You can't wear prosthetics, um, even if you have, um, you know, there's just not a socket for the fit. So he has this huge, he had to be devised with these amazing prostheticists at Walter Reed, who I got to know. An amazing hip, like a hip garter belt, that is so heavy. And he became an expert at stride, gait, um, movement, silicon on your leg to make the thing go in the, in the morning when your leg is thin and still stay there at night when your leg is really fat. And he became a kind of amazing guy uh, who I visited at the MATC, the, um, I forget what that stands for, military athletic, I don't know, it's, it's the rehab center that's pretty remarkable at Walter Reed um, in my neighborhood. And he, he, he's now at Stanford Business School. I just spoke to him a few days ago. Um, and he, he told me he's not only walking with two canes, but walking with one cane. His resolve is pretty remarkable. So I don't know, you know, maybe this is a case of grit, discipline, and not a case of um, hope that. But there is some hope that, and that is he, Everyone in the army said, you're never going to walk again. But he found on the web or somewhere a guy named Kajilik, an American who was studying math in Czechoslovakia, um, and got hit straight on by a train, same kind of injury. By the way, above the knees, you probably know this, you guys, uh, two paper cuts. Two, two, two above the knee injuries, two paper cuts. One, a mere paper cut. I mean, the, the black humor is... Uh, um, uh, disturbing to those of us that aren't in the, in the, don't have skin in the game, so to speak. Um, but he said about this project of hope with Kajilik, which is that there was a kind of possibilism that galvanized him. He figured out how Kajilik was able to walk, and Kajilik became an expert para-athlete. Um, and brought him to Walter Reed, set up an alliance. There was an amazing, um, a gentle investment in planning. And I think hope, that project of hope, drove it. Um, and I think it illustrates Pettit's notion of pragmatic, the pragmatic rationality of hope. Definitely, did he create an epistemic landscape that was biased? Yes. He kept other, it was possible, you know, it kept a lot of countervening facts out of the picture, focused on 
best possible cases, um, but was not unaware of where he stood in the pecking order of those who got injured and though you know with one one below the knee amputation and people who lose their hands, which is very even more traumatic in many ways. Um, and so I think, interestingly, they traded places in fancy, to use Adam Smith's um, notion, that is Kajilik and, and Dan. Kajilik was there for Dan, and Dan was a reminder to Kajilik of what, would, what it was like only three years ago when he was still um, a novice in this injury. So that's an example of hope that. Hope in others. Dan's hope in this reconstructed narrative is, and I have the permission of all those whose names I mention. Um, Dan's hope in this reconstructed narrative is for an eventuality that he can walk, and he has. Um, but that hope is interlaced with normative hope. He invests hope in the medical and therapy staff at Walter Reed and the institution that supports the rehabilitative gym. He puts hope in the civilian contractors who make and fit prosthetics. He puts hope in his immediate circle of friends and family. He puts hope in Congress um, to authorize adequate allocations for veteran spending, to deliberate wisely about future military and humanitarian engagements, and to support wide world uh, wide world rights for persons with disabilities. He travels to uh, abroad and he needs to get off planes and use bathrooms. And he puts hope in the American electorate to put the right people into office to make these decisions. And he puts hope in American businesses. He is now working with one um, to create jobs and not just to create fanfare opportunities at nap games and uh, at airports. Um, so normative investments, I think, underlie his hopes for himself to be able to function well after military service in, in war. And as um, one way I sometimes think about it, I think I have about five, ten minutes. One way I think about it is through, uh, I do ancient philosophy and, and um, Stoic philosophy, um, Seneca, second century. A Roman writer has this amazing passage in De Beneficis on favors, um, about a benefit sometimes translated, about a ball of game, a, a ball of catch where you go back and forth and you have to, it's call and address essentially. You have to throw the ball so that there's uptake and then get it back to someone so that they can receive it again and acknowledge in this reciprocation and mirroring that that they're with you. They got the ball and they're going to adjust their level to catch it at the right level, et cetera. Um, and I think that analogy is useful. <clears throat> and I think um, there's a way of thinking, and in this way, hope is, is like trust, but a little different. Hope in persons is like trust, but a little different. We may not fully trust persons in their readiness to receive us appropriately, like a game of catch. But we may still hope in them, and in an even more robust way than trust, hope that our hope in them makes them responsive to our calls, that it scaffolds a response. Um, and we may need assistance in getting the ball to the person who's supposed to catch it. And here, what very much came to mind uh, was a, a discussion with a student at Georgetown, PhD student, I'll call her Roberta, an elite pilot, distinguished record of amazing record of academic laurels and military awards, is told by her face to her new commander that despite her promotion to a highly coveted senior job on his base, he fought against her going there and would continue to do everything he could to undermine her appointment. As he put it, using the lingo of her brothers on base, as she said, her very presence was disrupting the status quo and tearing down heritage and tradition. It's hard to imagine those words still, but that's them. In her case, she turned to a male mentor to help break into the bro network, as she said, and pleaded her cause. There was no way that her new boss could recognize directly from her that her hope in him to accept her on equal footing with her male peers was legitimate and something he had moral reason to commit to. 
he had to hear that through different channels. It's not even clear that he recognized the moral call in the end and may only have felt pressured for political reasons to act in conformity with regulation and policy. And so in Seneca's metaphor, again, of, the, of a game of cat, this is a case where an individual is already in a game of ball, so to speak, but can't get successful uptake from the, or successful catch from the recipient. And when she finally does, only through the intervention of another player, the successful catch may reflect changed behavior more than changed attitude. And then I have some things as why the failure of hope in persons, which is disappointment, isn't the same as resentment or isn't even tamped down resentment, but I'll leave that aside. And I'll finish up with one more notion of hope in self um, through, through again, um, a person uh, who I've come to know very, very well and his wife. So, um, in, much, in some of my work, I talk about soldiers maybe not having post-traumatic stress, but sort of being dogged by moral disappointment, falling short of expectations in a highly idealistic culture, and um, ethos uh, of do all, be all or do all, or be all and whatever you guys say. Um, be all you can be. <laughs> Sorry, the Navy creeps in here a little bit. Um, and um, I think sometimes that... Uh, Hope can be, or hope in self can be a corrective update to very harsh self reaction, self reactive responses, guilt and shame in particular, that can be crippling. You shouldn't underestimate the, uh, the uh, power of guilt and shame. Um, and you also can be bolstered through the hope others have in us. So here, um, and I, I talk a little bit about how you can think about moral address to yourself. I'll leave that aside. But Consider someone I've come to know fairly well named um, Lelo Paniagua, bread and water in Spanish. Um, L.A. Barrio kid signs up at 17 and a half in the Marines to escape tough life in the Barrio. Um, goes three tours around, uh, Fallu really tough tours, F Fallujah and Marja. Um, and sets up He's in our, uh, artillery dealing with stuff for the surge in 09, 10. Um, he gets severely rattled by war, traumatic brain, everything you can imagine, traumatic brain injury, post-traumatic stress, um, et cetera. But the Marines is, you know, once the Marine, always Marines. Marines is his identity. And coming home is devastating. Coming home with medical, he's now medically discharged with 90% medical disability is even more devastating. He has this amazing woman as his wife, and I'm totally biased here, so I'll just end on this note, whose name is Donna Hernandez, because she's my student, and I've come to know these people now for three, four years. And she, it, not everyone has a kind of angel like this, but she is a tough, sassy, brilliant woman, a school foreign service at Georgetown. She's now at Yale doing a security studies degree. Um, and has Crystal as one of her teachers, Stanley Crystal. And she has kind of pulled this guy through. She eloped it in her freshman year with Lalo, took both of them to escape LA, tough LA life. And she knows, in a way that he forgets totally, just how good a Marine he was decorated and the like. And she occasionally asks him to wear his uniform when he was still in service at official Georgetown events. Her graduation, she was um, doing stuff for the president at various presidential dinners, at Georgetown's president. So she mirrored, and Lalo has come to catch a little bit of that, to, to respond to her hope in him. Um, It'd be hard to spend any time with them and not pick this up. Uh, they've invested in each other's futures, he in her education, she in his healing from war. But, he's a, but she's a survivor of war no less than he is. And he also has hopes and has begun to return to university. Um, so they partner in this remarkable <coughs> call and response way. So I'll end on a Stoic um, note, and the Stoics very helpfully, and I think it's a helpful notion for the military, have a notion not of the sage who's you know, totally up there, totally perfect, but a progressor, like most of us. Um, we human progressors 
engage, are engaged in complicated moral and psychological interactions. We elicit change in response to each other's aspirations as well as our own. For a returning veteran, recognizing that another has invested hope in you can be deeply corrective and healing. It can nourish overall hope in self and sustain hope for projects and rekindle a sense of meaning and purpose after war. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hi, Major Shima. Great, thanks. Appreciate it. All right, well, actually, I should start out. I think I'd be remiss if I didn't just once again thank the kind folks at Villanova here to, for, for organizing this conference and then for the really warm reception, just the, the hospi uh, hospitality. Very much appreciated. Um, I, Richard, or Sir Richard, is apparently the cadets call him. That's going to stick, by the way. Um, I, I should. I, I've been advised not to start the story. It might undermine my uh, my sort of credibility in, in talking about the emotions, but I'll share it with you anyway, um, because I just will. So I, I expressed to my wife when I found out that I was going to be able to comment on one of Nancy's papers how excited I was about that, right? I, I had the good fortune of, of working with Nancy when I was doing my graduate work at Georgetown, and I was just really excited about the opportunity. So, so my wife asked the obvious question. She said, that is neat. What What's the paper about? And I said, well, it's... It's about moral emotions, it's about recovery from war. And she started to smile, and I was like, well, that's sort of the response I would expect to get from her. And she said, um, she said I suppose that works out. And she said, because if you have any expertise about the emotions, it's purely theoretical. So, <laughs> so she thought this was, she, Glad you guys think that's funny. <laughs> But then she, she kind of came back on that. She, she claimed that I do have limited, limited experience with emotions in the context of being a sports fan, which I suppose <laughs> is better than nothing, and I'll go with better than nothing, because um, sometimes I don't get that. So um, my, my goal here is, is, well, I don't know. I could probably, I'm a philosopher. I could break this up as many different ways as I, I could think to break it up, and many different words I could think of. But really, I, I want to kind of try and clarify um, partially if for no other reason than, than to facilitate discussion and to make sure I got it right. <laughs> so, um, so that's the first thing I'm going to do. And then maybe point out some things, um, tie experiences that, that, that I've had or I've seen to, to the experiences that Nancy kind of related, and, and, and kind of use those as a way to focus on particular aspects of the view that I, that I think led me to some questions and, and maybe use that as a, as a way forward. So, it seems like the natural place to start then is to talk about what what is Nancy's project and and the broad focus just straightforwardly is moral repair right how do we we have this we have this just corpus of people coming home from these wars and we have these problems that we're having a really hard time getting our arms around right this this isn't a new problem but it seems to have manifested itself in particular ways not not the least of which and probably the most obvious way is the suicide rates right so suicide rates amongst um, the armed forces, but army personnel um, in particular from my experience, have kind of been a, a focal concern. So the question is, how can we use something like building healthy relationship with ourselves and with others to cope with the particular traumas and the particular challenges of warfare? But more specifically, what, what Nancy's talking about, she's talking about hope in persons, both in yourself and in others, and she says there's a distinct kind of positive reactive attitude that focuses energies and attention on pockets of goodwill in the self and others as occasion for aspiration and investment. And I think those two words at the end play a particularly important role in the view that she's offering in, in terms of aspiration and investment. So from there, we can, we can ask and, and, try and try and understand through her, through her paper, her project more broadly, what is hope on this view? Well, it's a reactive attitude. What's a reactive attitude? Well, a reactive attitude is basically a moral emotion. But the idea is that these aren't moral emotions that just sort of respond to underlying beliefs about what moral responsibility is. The idea is that, that they are actually constitutive of moral responsibility. So it's a particular sort of understanding of emotions. And, and some examples in the negative case, which she talked about all of these, but guilt, shame, resentment, disappointment. Um, but the claim is that, for the most part, a lot of the research in this field has tended, at least historically, to focus on the negative emotions. So the claim is that maybe part of this project, maybe part of trying to understand this, is to recognize that hope is a kind of an example, at least, of this sort of positive corollary to these negative reactive emotions. So Nancy takes us to be opposed to indifference. 
And we can see as we start talking about moral recovery how these, can, we, these are obviously opposed in, in, in some really relevant, relevant sense. She talked about and made clear that it's a sort of call and response model, right? It's, it's a calling out. It's uh, got different components, but the idea is you are putting out that you're looking for a response of a certain sort in others, right? And these sort of, these sort of calls and responses are generally reciprocal. You, you put them out and people give them back and they sort of form this, this <coughs> landscape of calls and responses um, that form the basis of the, the relationships that she ultimately thinks are going to be um, helpful in understanding moral recovery from war. But they're param paradigmatically forward-looking. They're about possibility. It's about trying to figure out how to find some comfort in the life that you have in front of you from the experience that have now kind of colored the life that you left behind. Maybe, maybe that would be one way of thinking of this. But it essentially has two components, and I think this is an important point. The first, and she calls it non-normative hope, but it's roughly hope that, right? You're, you're looking for states of affairs to obtain in the world. And um, to, I'll, to, to put this in Aristotelian terms, external goods play a role in our uh, achievement of happiness. And this is a sort of recognition of that. And it's a fundamental aspect of recovery. And, and I think it responds very differently. And I'll talk about this in a bit. But depending upon the types of, of injury that, that we've suffered, and um, physical injury and moral injury, and the way that those sort of interact with one another. The other, the other piece of this is, is what she refers to as normative hope. And these are sort of aspiring in other people, right? It's normative because you're, you're hoping they aspire to be certain sorts of people, to value certain sorts of things. And this is where that call and response network probably plays the, the greatest role. So I, I actually like the way that, that Nancy put this in the paper, so I'll just read it quoted verbatim. But she says that hope for an Aristotelian, and probably for most of us, slides between hope in one's agency and reason and that of others, and hope for a hospitable world in which we exercise our individual and collective agency, right? So we're looking not just for, for the cultivation of virtue to be the, the right sort of person and the role that hope plays in this. We're also hoping for the, well, just the universe to work out in our favor in some significant respects. So the point of this whole, this whole reactive emotion, this positive reactive emotion, is that the point of addressing others with hope is that recipients might take up the values or principles deemed worthwhile and aspired for on their behalf. So hope can scaffold normative change. We can sort of bootstrap others up and, and vice versa, right, towards, towards aspiring to be something better. Now I said this has these two separate elements, normative and non-normative hope. I want to start with a brief discussion of, of hope in outcomes, because my sense is that if, if you were to lose your leg, if you were to suffer, suffer the sort of injuries that Dan Brzezinski suffered, um, hope and outcomes would have to play a pretty critical role in, in recovery. I, I just, I, I, I have to imagine that, right? Um, as a matter of fact, a, a classmate of mine who, who lost his vision serving around, this is fairly early in the conflict, um, but, but I remember hearing remarks saying things like, this, this isn't what life is supposed to be like, right? He had some small children, the idea is like, I'm supposed to be able to see my children grow up. And I, I think that, that what this kind of illustrates is that this despair that we see coming out in post-traumatic stress, however you want to describe it, comes out of this expectation what life is supposed to look like and what it actually looks like, right? And we can see in a case like that where straightforwardly it's just probably the case that he's never going to see his kids in the sense that he, that he traditionally understood that, right? The idea is that this requires some imagination. I'll come back to this in a second. But the idea is that despair is going to emerge from, from this inability to close the gap between what life is like and, and what life is supposed to be like. And we can imagine how returning from warfare could lead to pretty stark contrast between the two. So Nancy says that hope then is a pragmatic rationality. It redirects effortful planning to eventualities that a mere probability-driven analysis might reject. So the idea is that this isn't just like wishing that you'd win the lottery. This is about, this is about agency. This is about investing in projects, right? Particularly where those projects might have been a bit prohibitive if we just one in a million chance you, Dan Brzezinski might ever walk again, doing the, doing the math about what we invest our time and effort in, most of us might reject that. And the claim is that, that hope allows us to sort of bridge this gap, this, this sort of non-normative hope. So the key is that hope on this view is about agency, right? It allows us to invest in projects in spite of odds, which I, I immediately find myself thinking, great, this is a start. But 
But one thing that concerns me is, that, well, so not Nord Hope does give us something to aim at in the world, but one concern that, that starts to, to appeal to me is, and I, I'm going to share a story with you about um, Army resiliency training. So, um, and I don't mean to poke fun at a serious problem or an approach to the problem, but I think it's important to get the kind of tenor of the discussion that the Army's having about this, about this sort of problem. Um, so, I can't remember if it was a rash of suicides last year, but it led to additional mandated training. And I, I remember piling in an auditorium with roughly a, a thousand other officers serving at the military academy to get this mandatory resiliency training. And it was clear that some people had put some thoughts into how they how they wanted to how they how they wanted to articulate this to all of us, right? How they wanted to make sure that we um, could be more resilient. And the one thing, seriously, the one thing that stands out to me about that training in a room full of people, most of whom had deployed for a year, two years, some three years and more, um, so a lot of combat deployments and experience was they said you have to learn to be a tennis ball, not an egg. When you drop an egg, it cracks. You have to be able to rebound. You have to be resilient. And my sense is that there may be something descriptive about resiliency. That may be what it looks like. Um, and the analogy may be apt. My concern is that I don't know how practical that is. I don't know if that gives us practical guidance about how to actually develop resiliency. <laughs> Might have been a bit snarky, I apologize. So, so the, the, the question that I have then is, how do we facilitate hope when confronting this sort of indifference, right? When you're my classmate that lost his vision and is sitting here facing life with, with these children that he loves very dearly, that, I mean, I imagine getting on the plane, that's the first and last thing he thought about, his wife and his kids, and how his relation to them has fundamentally changed. So if he's resilient, which, Somehow he was, right? I mean, he's a remarkably resilient guy. Um, but if he doesn't have that, if he is indifferent, how do we how do we generate that? And Nancy, I know your your, your focus, and you said this in the talk, isn't isn't clinical practice. But I find myself drawing in that sort of practical direction, just because, well, frankly, it matters a lot. And um, I find myself sort of sort of wondering about that. But. Maybe a brief discussion of normative hope, and then, then I want to talk a bit about imagination, because this kind of comes back to non-normative hope. But, so on normative hope, the, the claim pretty simply is that normative hope is a sort of mutual expression of, of normative expectations in others. What sort of people can we become, and do we expect others to become? What sort of people do we expect ourselves to become, right? It's directed inward. It's directed outward. It's got this sort of multi-dimensionality to it, right? So we, we sort of lift one another up through these normative expectations. So I'm going to read a, a brief excerpt from the case of Dan Brzezinski. And, and actually, Nancy, you already read this, but it, it just sort of it clarified to me what you meant by normative hope, and I think it might be useful. So I'll read it and hope I'm not wrong. All right. So Dan, of course, was the soldier who lost both of his legs above the knee and, and a hip in, in an IED, catastrophic IED in Iraq. So Dan's hope in this reconstructive narrative is for an eventuality that he can walk. But that hope is interlaced with normative hope. He invests hope in the medical and therapy staff at Walter Reed and in the institution that supports its rehabilitative gym. He puts hope in the civilian contractors who make and fit prosthetics for veterans. He puts hope in his immediate circle of friends and family. He puts hope in Congress in myriad ways to authorize adequate allocations for veteran spending and to deliberate wisely about future military humanitarian engagements and to support worldwide rights for persons with disabilities. So I think that does a good job of capturing exactly what sort of reaching out for, that, that hope is on this account. And I think the other thing it, it does pretty well is it, it points out just how far this sort, of, this sort of network stretches, right? Somebody with the severity of injuries that, that Dan has is reaching pretty far, and you would expect them maybe to have to. So, I mean, we could even look at the case of... Uh, of, of, of Marine Sergeant Lalo Paniagua? Paniagua. Paniagua. Not even close. All right. So he finds creative inspiration in, in understanding his, his wife's vision of himself, right? She projects what she sees him as, what she has seen him to be, and he draws inspiration from that. So this is, this is what norma normative hope does for us. But I want to come back in a sense, and maybe this bears on both, but, but I want to talk about the role of imagination. Because this just seems really critical to me. And, and Nancy acknowledges in the, in the paper, she says, look, imagination plays some role here. 
And I guess what, I, what I'm gonna kind of suggest is it seems to me that imagination has to play a huge role. And I'm concerned that issues of personal identity creep into this as well, right? So my thought is that each discrete injury probably requires a different sort of imagining of, of what life is gonna look like going forward, depending on the severity of physical injuries, of mental wounds, um, how, how, how one's war experiences stick with them individually, right? Like my sense is probably no two are completely alike. So I start to wonder, Dan Bershinsky, maybe it's obvious, maybe it's not. Why, why was it that walking became the thing that provided a basis for investment in his agency? Why that, right? It seems like there could be lots of other things that might stretch forward, like might come to your mind as things that he might be interested in doing. But I don't know. Maybe if, if I lost both my legs in a hit, maybe that would captivate me. It seems maybe to, to proceed too quickly to suggest that's all that kind of motivated him or all that captured him. I mean, he's, he's an MBA candidate at Stanford, right? He's reinvented himself in that way. He's, he's transitioned from the Army, and he's sort of reinvented himself in that other sense, too. But I, I want to say that's a significant, significant reimagining. And it just strikes me, I don't know if I want to call it arbitrary, I just don't know what it tracks. But I'll, I'll give you uh, like just enough details, because I don't have permission to use anybody's name, um, to make you think that I'm probably making the story up. But trust me, I'm not. So Lieutenant Colonel Battalion Commander in Iraq 2007, um, broad details. He gets hit by a catastrophic ID on the northeast side of Baghdad, his, his Humvee does. Two of the other soldiers in the Humvee are killed instantly. He loses both legs below the knee and suffers some serious injuries to, I believe, his, his, his right side. But his, his life is very much in question. His ability to survive the injuries was probably extended for the better part of a month, month and a half. And I believe he was in a coma for a good portion of that. But this is a guy who was an avid runner. He was a husband, father of three, huge runner, apparently. One of these guys that was never like really fast. He wasn't Steve Prefontaine, but he just loved to go out and run, right? This is what he did. This is how he identified himself. So he, he lost his legs, he's still fighting for his life, but he's kind of come to, and he's, I believe, in law school at the time. I, I had some, some common acquaintances, I didn't know him personally, but he, uh, first thing he said, almost immediately, like he, he saw his, his, his wife, his kids, he apparently went through a brief period where he's like, well, this is pretty awesome, I'm not dead. And then from there proceeded to ask when they could get him fitted for some prosthetics so he could go run, right? And it just stands out to me like, what? Why that, right? This is a guy who, who has kids, who has these other relationships, who command responsibility, we talked about that, right, in, in, in the paper, who lost two soldiers in the, in the ID strike that took his legs. It's just amazing that this would be his immediate response. It's amazing to me, maybe it's more obvious. Um, I don't know. But my sense is that um, the more complete loss of an identity, the more limited hope might be by imagination. So my first thought was actually to my classmate and a loss of vision, right? I, my vision is how I relate to the entire world around me, and, and, and I, I can't imagine losing it. I, um, take, I can't imagine what it would be like to be about. I can't imagine what it would be like to be me without sight. But I think of other stuff that's maybe even more fundamental. So, a couple things like serious cognitive impairment, right? What if, what if I have a serious brain injury that, that affects who I am, like in, in, in very real ways? So is a normative component of hope sufficient to overcome imagination in these cases? So what limits moral repair on this model? Do I have to be, a, be able to imagine the person that I'm trying to become? In that case, it seems like imagination is doing a lot of the work. So lastly, I'll just finish with a couple quick points. I'm concerned that the standing that allows one to call an address or bootstrap normative hope comes from trust, right? So what about a case where a soldier feels that he's been betrayed? Where the people that would be reaching out, the, the soldiers at Walter Reed, uh, this army psychologist, what about when he doesn't trust the institution? It might just be a fact that, that the army is not well positioned to help that soldier. But I, I concern myself with that, because um, I think it follows from this model. But finally, this account offers a good account of how the physical harms of war and the moral harms of war are inseparable and in facilitating moral recovery. But I think the challenge is particularly acute where the moral harms of war and the development of post-traumatic stress are the only symptoms. Where, it's, where visible symptoms aren't present, so I'm thinking of severe post-traumatic stress, I, I really wonder if such an understanding of hope offers uh, the appropriate sort of clinical approach to affecting recovery. Like how would, how would clinicians work with those soldiers where it's not clear what sort of identity is gonna provide the end state to, to work through this. So I've gone over time, um, my apologies. Thank you so much.
Dr. Sherman for her very thought-provoking paper and for sharing her ethical perspectives with us. Over the last 20 years, I have been very fortunate to try to serve those who have served our country in working with military veterans and their families at the Philadelphia VA Medical Center. Also many years ago, I, bought, I brought Villanova nursing students to the psychiatric units at the Philadelphia VA Medical Center. And after that, I have worked as a clinical researcher and interacted with many veterans and their families in multiple studies. Currently, I'm principal investigator on an NIH-funded study that evaluates the impact of an innovative home intervention for veterans with mild to moderate traumatic brain injury and their families. So through all these experiences, I have gained a deep appreciation for the sacrifice of veterans and their families. I've listened intently to their stories, and I've also learned so much from their wisdom, their insights, and their experiences, many of which I cannot even imagine. In response to Dr. Sherman's paper, I bring my research and clinical perspectives to the table. And so I will focus on three main areas. Number one, the emerging construct of moral injury. Number two, the role of hope in moral repair as described by Dr. Sherman and other authors. And number three, moral injury as a community concern. So I'm taking a little different Sorry. angle in this response. Dr. Sherman addresses moral repair which she defines as building up healthy relationships with self and with others after war. Her central premise is that hope, hope in self and hope in others is a type of positive reactive attitude that directs energies towards goodwill in self and others. And as others have said, Kevin has said, enables one to look forward towards the future and see the possibilities, imagine the possibilities. The process of moral repair is a journey for those who have experienced moral injury, a multidimensional construct that is receiving great attention now in the literature, in the military, and the VA health system. Litz and his colleagues in 2009 developed a conceptual model for moral injury, and they raised possible intervention strategies designed to facilitate moral injury and work is very early in that area. But Litz and his colleagues define moral injury as perpetrating, failing to prevent, bearing witness to, or learning about acts that transgress deeply held moral beliefs and expectations. The person becomes aware of the dissonance between his morals, his ethics, and his experience, causing great internal conflict. In the past, before the recent attention to moral injury, many clinicians concentrated on the trauma faced by our servicemen and women, but they paid little attention to the events that raised ethical conflicts for them, and that often produced guilt and shame. In Hodge's 2003 study of soldiers deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan, 32% reported killing an enemy combatant, and 60% reported seeing ill and wounded women and children who they were unable to help, both of which can be ethically challenging for soldiers. Other sources for moral injury identified in the literature include harming non-combatants, such as civilians, due to the ambiguity of the situation, ambiguity of the enemy, sending soldiers to situations of injury or death when you're the leader, failing to protect peers or civilians, failing to save the injured if you're the medic, witnessing the behaviors of a fellow soldier that are troubling to you. And even another example in the literature, raiding a family's home and seeing the fright in the eyes of children in that family. And there are many other examples, just as there are many situations in war that create ethical challenges. One field survey in 2008 by the Army Mental Health Advisory Team reported 
that 27% of soldiers faced ethical situations that they did not know how to respond to, and often forced to make very quick decisions in difficult situations. Understanding moral injury is in its infancy state and evidence-based strategies to help soldiers are under study. The need to build our knowledge in this area is urgent. The increasing number of veterans with moral injury may be growing due to longer and more frequent deployments. <coughs> One study by the same Army Mental Health Advisory team reported that longer deployments were related to more difficulties in ethical decision making on the battlefield. When the service members return home and are no longer in the military context, they may struggle with ethical conflicts that surface soon after deployment or perhaps many years later. In the early 90s, I remember one veteran who sought mental health treatment at the VA many years after his combat experience in Vietnam. He reported that he had killed a child who was seven years old, whom he had many reasons to believe was carrying bombs. Years later, when his own son turned seven, the veteran struggled with heightened PTSD, flashbacks, and moral injury related to the event. His therapist, who was very well versed in PTSD therapy, was unsure about how to approach moral injury. Remember that at this time, there were few discussions of this notion. The therapist stressed the ambiguity of many situations in war and worked with him and his family to reconnect with his many good deeds and sides, an approach that mirrors Dr. Sherman's model of the critical role of hope in contributing to moral repair. Many of our returning vets are unable to articulate their moral injury because they experience shame and as more time passes, they view themselves as not only having committed perhaps an unforgivable act, but that they themselves are unforgivable. In her paper, Dr. Sherman beautifully discusses the potential role of two types of hope, hope in self and the hope of others in healing moral injury. She tells the story of Leo, who took part in a very dangerous mission and was a strong leader for his unit. But after his deployment, he feels a void, a lack of purpose and meaning in his life. Hope enables him to see the possibilities in himself, to have a positive impact in life, to again have meaning in his life. I often hear this, this theme from many veterans who express a desire to help others, often other veterans. They find ways to reach out to their veteran buddies, assisting them to navigate the complex VA health system, helping them to apply for veteran benefits or disability compensation, and connecting them with mental health services. In my traumatic brain injury study, almost every veteran participant stated he took part to help his fellow vets with TBI. These acts also exemplify hope as identified by Dr. Sherman. They represent what Litz and others have called exposure to corrective life experiences. Experiences where veterans have more positive judgments about themselves by, by their good deeds and also feel more positive about the world in seeing the good deeds done by others. As Litz states, these corrective life experiences counter self-expectations of moral questioning and the experience of being tainted by various acts. Dr. Sherman also discusses hope in self as a process that renews soldiers who are disappointed in themselves when they feel they have fallen short of what it means to be a good soldier in their eyes. She again walks us through the journey of Lalo, who was in charge of 12 Marines, who we thought of as his kids. One stepped on an IED and was killed and Leo still struggles with this guilt many years later. Dr. Sherman recounts how Leo's wife is critical, is the critical component to his process of moral repair. Her hope in him, both implicit and very explicit, and her vision of him as, and I love this quote, absolutely lovable, has a palpable impact on him. Her hope in him elicits his hope in himself, and he begins to recognize the good in himself and how good a Marine he is. Dr. Sherman also emphasizes the role of relationships and facilitating moral repair. 
Likewise, other authors have stressed that moral injury is not a medical diagnosis that is addressed only by pushing the veteran towards medical treatment. Tyler Boudreaux, who was a 12-year veteran of the Marine Corps, commanded an infantry company in Iraq, and he spoke about this in what I considered as the most compelling way. <clears throat> What's most useful, he said, about the term moral injury is it takes the problem out of the hands of the mental health profession and the military and attempts to place it where it belongs, in society, in the community, and in the family, precisely where moral questions should be posed and wrangled with. It transforms patients back into citizens and diagnoses into dialogue. Other authors, such as Dr. Rita Brock, who wrote the book Soul Repair, stress that moral repair requires a reconstruction of moral identity and meaning, and that the support of a caring community is key to this process. Dr. Sherman's work reflects this broader societal direction in work around moral injury by highlighting how community and family pay, play a major role in healing the wounds of war and moral injury. This conference also represents a very important initiative in stimulating much needed dialogue around the sensitive and pressing issue of moral injury and moral repair. Dr. Gala True is an anthropologist at the Philadelphia VA Medical Center, and she has used a very creative research method in which she tries to elicit the voices of our veterans. And she gives them a camera, and she asks them to take pictures that tell their stories about the impact of deployment on their mental and physical health. One Marine Corps soldier, a woman, took a picture of herself looking hardcore, as she called it, holding her <coughs> rifle. But underneath her picture, she stated, this is me trying to look hardcore. I am locked and loaded, but I'm not really so hardcore at all. I always had this mentality like, if it's me or you, I want to go home, but I never wanted to kill anyone. Another veteran took a picture of a shrine to his friend who was killed and they were on patrol together. And there's a picture of his friend in this image. And he wrote underneath, this is for my friend. He had a wife and three kids. I can't stop feeling guilty about his death. All these people love this guy. If it had been me, it would not have been such a big deal. These words and images vividly portray and speak to moral injury. They also underscore the imperative of our communities to stand with veterans and soldiers to support them in their journey towards moral repair. I also would like to mention that pictures from this Photo Voice project, which are extremely compelling and powerful, are on display in the Wilma Theater this weekend on Broad Street. So I encourage you, if you have a chance, to go down and see the, the beautiful voices from our veterans. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, we have a little bit of time for some questions from our audience. I'm going to give the microphone to you all. <laughs> Um, can you stand up to maybe just briefly identify yourself and ask the question? I'm going to have the respondents. You say that the question back out again so much the audience understand what the response to. And uh, so with that in mind, uh, do we have any questions from our audience? Please. My name is Megan Strathy. I'm a senior here at the College of Nursing. Uh, resilience, which is an essential aspect of maintaining hope, is sometimes dismantled by psychological illness such as depression or PTSD as a result of war. Ultimately, if one cannot cope with or recover from psychological illness, will they have any chance of moral repair? Um, what I'm asking is, is moral repair independent from or dependent on psycho psychological integrity? Um, 
So the, I'm sorry, is it Megan? Yes. So Megan asked, um, will, uh, is moral injury, moral repair independent of psychological recovery, especially when there's uh, real post-traumatic stress or, or traumatic um, uh, injury? I think of it, and, and another person that works and co-authors with Brett Litz, who I've been in panels with, is Bill Nash, a Navy uh, psychiatrist. They do a lot of their work together. And he very clearly views it as a dimension of post-traumatic stress. And the newest um, Diagnostic and Statistic Manual views it as that way as well. Now, post-traumatic stress is a terrible word. You know, it's, it's a huge spectral notion. And the survey instruments are weak and poor. You know, you guys go, get off a plane and you check off things. and. You know, you just want to get a latte, as some people tell me, and forget, or see your kids, forget what you say. So, you know, have you been exposed to war, et cetera. So we don't have, the, the, the figures aren't great. Maybe Chuck, Chuck Ho claims they are better, you know, better than I say they are. But, but um, anyway, I think it's a dimension, and certainly it'll be harder, it, the, the more severe the, the post-traumatic stress. And meds are play a role. There's also, we didn't talk about this, but and I know brain, I'm no neurobiologist, but there is prefrontal cortex damage that means that when you are picking up body parts, you know, muscle and stuff and living with those trash bags that are body bags for two days sometimes before you repatriate with the body and medevac it properly. You're getting a lot of imprints that aren't getting processed, and the memory consolidation is nasty. It just goes back to stuff that isn't being processed. So it's not only um, you can't process it in your family because you can't because you can't really even see it without having a flashback. So I think that's an issue. I just wanted to add that research looking at interventions to help promote moral repair is is so early in development. And one of the questions that comes to my mind is, how does a traumatic brain injury interact with these different interventions under study? And in my study, it includes veterans with mild to moderate traumatic brain injury, not severe. But I, I think that we need to have so much more research to really understand how different folks do with different kinds of interventions. I'm a sophomore at Villanova. Um, my question is for you, Dr. Sherman. You, um, one of the definitions sort of, that you gave for hope is um, a form of planning that anchors you, which seems to me is placed fully in the future. And so my question is, um, in the journey to achieve moral repair, do you think that it's morally permissible for the individual to attempt to forget the past and the role that they had in warfare? Um, and if not, how does hope reconcile both the past and the future? Thank you. Um, Kate asked a great question, sophomore um, Villanova, um, about hope being directed toward the future. And do you forget the past um, in looking forward to the future, especially when it's a tra traumatic past? In another chapter of this book, I talk about self-empathy as a way of connecting reconnecting with your past self that can feel terrible and that can be very marred and scarred and that overcoming the numbing is really important to use a psychoanalytic term owning a past self rather than just marching forward I've done a lot of work on stoicism not I'm not an empirical researcher but um, uh, theoretical researcher. And um, the stoic mentality of suck it up and truck on, uh, popularized, um, you know, leaves a lot behind. And I don't think that's the way to go. But I do think that being able to revisit some of the past is very, very hard. This uh, compassionate, per you know, you bring back soldiers. I think Brett Litz has called it in this panel we sat on together, the open chair technique. You have an empty chair, an empty chair, and you bring in the soldier who, like Lalo, um, feels he culpably lost. Um, and you sort of see if that person would hold you to the same kind of rebuke that you hold yourself. And, and that's a way of revisiting the past and reframing it, as you say, re rethinking about it. And some authors talk about integration 
it's not denial, yes. but it's you integrate it into yourself. And it reminds me of what I had seen clinically in the past. I worked with the Pennsylvania Sudden Infant Death Syndrome Center with bereaved parents who suffered sudden death of a child. And many of them said, you never get over death of a child. You get used to it. That child becomes part of you. And it reminded me of, a bit of that concept of it becomes integrated within yourself in a way that still carries pain, but not constant pain, and also can bring some joy to your life in terms of your perspective about what's important in life. When you talk to bereaved parents, they'll tell you, you know, they don't sweat the small stuff as much anymore because of what they've experienced. Just right here, a long time ago, um, in the thread of life, Richard Valheim, an interesting philosopher of mind, now deceased, um, wrote about his own experiences in war in World War II and how, as he remembers now what he went through then, he still feels some of the stuff. You know, I'm thinking that you're not numb, you know, depending, there's some continuity, you can kind of bring it up in some way, but it has different cognitive overlay. Oh, here. Hi, my name is Armand Samani. I'm in here at Villanova University. This question is for all the speakers, but uh, first Dr. Moyaga, please. You cited, you didn't, I don't think you cited any military experience, but you have like a strong desire to help people who come out of the military. And hope, in a lot of ways, I believe is relative. Just like believing somebody, it's easiest to believe in somebody if you relate to them. And I think of every time someone has rejected logical sound advice with, you don't know what I've been through, or you don't understand. How does this barrier exist in helping in non-veterans, helping veterans? If not, why is it absent in that dynamic and present everywhere else? But I imagine it exists. And like how with people that aren't, that don't have the experience help the people that do. So you're questioning whether there's a need for veterans to help other veterans to have that level no, of connection? No, my, my question is if somebody, if you are not a veteran and you want to help a veteran and they say to you, you don't understand me, you don't know the things I've seen, what do you say back to that? You're exactly right, I don't. No, I mean, I say that to the veterans. And I'm exactly right because I have to walk in your shoes. You know, there, but I just want to say something. On this very thing, there was a great op ed piece about three weeks ago by a guy who is a soldier, I'm pretty sure Army. Um, Philip. Help me out here. Philip Clay, I think his name is. He's on the book tour. And he essentially begins, the, the piece begins, and he's written short stories actually, but based on his own experience. With get over, you just don't understand it. Meaning, said by a, a rape trauma victim or a child of abuse, you, you do understand. And then he thinks it's a kind of, I think some of it's true, that it's a bit of a defense on the part of both the civilian who backs off and on the part of the military service member who put, who only will go for a beer some tell me, you know, with fellow service members because they may break down or have a flashback. Of course, it's so dependent on the therapeutic relationship, which takes time to develop. In the case of the Vietnam War vet that I mentioned, I had talked to his therapist who struggled <coughs> with how do I respond. And one of the things she said was, I let him know I accepted him I was non-judgmental. I accepted him. I said to him, I've never been in your shoes in that situation. So I don't know how I would react either. So she gave unconditional acceptance to him that enabled the therapeutic alliance to develop. And then he could you know, start to work on that moral injury that he was struggling with. I think we have time for one final question. Could I, oh, I'm sorry. I'd just like to respond to that briefly, too. I think one thing that's kind of important here when we talk about those that have served and those that haven't is I think it's a mistake to assume that military service is this sort of like homogenous sort of thing, right? Um, Ian's experiences as a special forces officer are, are probably significantly different than mine as an aviation officer, right? Like you can probably tell you all kinds of horror stories. I could tell you about the time where like my air conditioning died while I was up flying. But, like, I mean, and I, I put this 
that's sort of like hard. But I think I think the point is that there's there's two things. One, is, <laughs> seriously, it really happened. No. It was, <laughs> two things. One is that not all veterans have the same experience, and I think that's an important point of perspective, trying to, like, thinking, thinking of yourself as an outsider. In some senses, you're probably not much more of an outsider than certain service members in the same situation, right? So if, if, if you're feeling like you don't have standing in there, I mean, I think just the sort of investment of care, like, I am concerned, and the reaching out is, is important in that respect. Um, and then the other thing is, there's not... Resilience. I mean, you talked before about how resilience is shaped by a lot of different factors, right? And some of them are stresses. You'd be surprised at some of the people that have clinically diagnosed PTSD if you looked at what they saw and experienced. There's other people that don't have PTSD, and you look at them and you're like, dude, how do you not have PTSD? Like, there's, there's just resilience varies from person to person. So I think just recognizing the complexity of the, the situation should help you in some respect, just being able to reach out. Like, you're probably not as far outside as you might think you are. Hopefully it helps. Actually, that might be a good note to, to wrap up on. We're close to the end. So I just give a round of applause.